Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 80 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of November 1st to 7th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting at you and telling you stories and so on, uh, trying to tell you about things that are important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch the email address, which you probably didn't, uh, you can check out my website. It's Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and that will be up here a couple of times during the show. And uh, you can get the email address from there. If you do send me email, please include something like, uh, left side of the aisle or, or your cable show or something like that uh, in the subject line so I know it's not spam. I'm a little, a little slow about answering sometimes, but I do answer. Right, so uh, with that, we get started. I'm gonna, I've been talking a couple of times recently. I've mentioned the word classism, and I said I've been going to talking about it, so I'm going to take that time now to do it. Classism, um, it's what I've come to call classism, and other people have come to do the same. It's a, it's a form of bigotry. It's a form of bigotry. Uh, it's one that could be defined very broadly as regarding yourself as superior to those who are of a lower economic class than you, but as a practical matter, what it really means is contempt for the poor. Uh, this is what lay at the heart of uh, Whitless Romney's infamous, deservedly infamous, 47% remark. Uh, now, in case you've been living on the moon the last couple of months, uh, I'm going to tell you what he said. This is quoting. And by the way, I found this. one of the things I found funny was that when this video of this was first released, it was just a piece of it, and the Romney campaign was, well, I really wish they would release the whole thing, which was done the very next day, and <laughs> okay, so much for that. All right, this is what he said. This is on May 17th. He said it as a, at, a, at a private fundraiser with a bunch of very rich people. Quoting, there are 47% of the people who will vote for the president no matter what, all right? There are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it, that that's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. These are people who pay no income tax. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. And so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. Now, a lot of attention went to uh, Romney saying that uh, people who pay no federal income tax are dependent upon government and believe they are victims. Uh, the fact is, no American likes to be told that they think they're a victim. We like to think of ourselves as a very self-reliant people. So saying to somebody, well, you think you're a victim is a real insult. And talk about how he's dismissing nearly half the country and so on. Uh, there's actually also been a good number of smackdowns of what he said. One thing pointing out that all he's talking about is federal income tax. That's only one sort of tax. And that over 60% of the people who don't pay that income tax do pay payroll taxes. That is, they're working. And most of the rest of those people are either retired, um, they are uh, disabled, or they're on active military duty, uh, they may be completely unemployed, that kind of thing. This is basically, they don't owe taxes. Um, and in fact, I remember saying to a, a friend of mine, a co-worker, uh, last year, she was uh, complaining about how they had to come up with money to pay their federal taxes. And I told her, you should be glad you have to pay federal taxes, because it means you're well enough off to owe them. Nearly half of your fellow citizens are not. But uh, the thing is, they also, other people also pointed out that, uh, you know, these people who don't pay federal income tax, they may pay a lot of other taxes, sales taxes, excise taxes, they may pay state taxes, local taxes, there may be property taxes, there's all kinds of taxes they might pay. And it was rather pointedly mentioned by the uh, Tax Policy Center that an estimated 4,000 households with incomes over a million dollars and another 14,000 with incomes between half a million and a million dollars paid no federal income tax in 2011. Now, for my part, when the video came out, I said here on the show that actually, yes, those folks are entitled to health care, housing, and so on, because we all are. As human beings, we are entitled to a certain 
basic level of living sufficient to maintain health. In fact, I even pointed out at the time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which the U.S. is an original signatory, says that in so many words. But there's a line in Romney's blather that's gotten less attention than I think it deserves, but which I think really goes to the heart of it. It really goes to the heart of Romney's attitudes, one that he felt so comfortable expressing among his, among his fat cat friends in the confidence that they would share that attitude. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. That's it. That's the core of this whole thing. People are poor. People need help. People are hungry. People are cold. People have no health care. All because they won't take personal responsibility. It's an age-old, and it is age-old, notion among those who have food to eat and a warm bed to sleep in, who have doctors and nurses and hospitals to go to when they're sick or when they're injured. Uh, the notion among those who are not afflicted to imagine that those who are afflicted deserve their fate, deserve their condition, because they are lazy, they are indolent, they are shiftless malingerers with no self-control. They will not take personal responsibility. Here's an example of this from last year. Now, Newt Grinch was uh, in one of those hundreds of Gopper primary debates, uh, and this one is from last November. He proposed putting an end to child labor laws. Why, he said? Because then poor children could be in the labor force and learn responsibility, just like the good old days. At the debate, he lauded the idea of five-year-old children working. He said, and I'm quoting him here, if you take one half of the New York janitors, you could give lots of poor kids work experience in the cafeteria, in the school library, in the front office, in a lot of different things. I'll stand by the idea young people ought to learn how to work. And at this, this Republican audience burst into a loud ovation. Now, why was the idea of revoking what he called stupid child labor laws so popular among Gopper primary voters? because of the adjective which they clearly heard, but which was overlooked in most of the commentary on this. The word poor. They were not applauding the idea of children working. They're not applauding the idea of five-year-old children working. They're certainly not applauding the idea of their own dear sweet little darlings five-year-old working. No, they're applauding the idea of five-year-old poor children working. The next month, Grinch made it explicit. He said, really poor children, I'm quoting him again, in really poor neighborhoods have no habits of working and have nobody around them who works. So they literally have no habit of showing up on Monday. They have no habit of staying all day. They have no habit of, if I do this and you give me cash, unless it's illegal. So, of course, poor people don't work unless it's criminal. Now, the thing is, note here he specifically referred in this thing to New York, to New York janitors. Now, do you think that when he talked about young people learning how to work, that folks in that audience were conjuring up child, uh, images of the children of some poor white dirt farmer in Appalachia or Mississippi? That they were thinking of some down-on-their-luck white family in Indianapolis? You know damn well they weren't. Because, you see, it's, it's them. It's those people. Those other people. The not-us. You know who we mean. They have no work ethic. They don't know how to work like we do. They're all shiftless, lazy, and so their kids are all the same. So yes, there is a great deal of racism within classism. But there is also an overlay of contempt for the poor, no matter their race. I mean, it's not just poor blacks. It's white trash. It's trailer trash. It's the great unwashed, the riffraff. The whatever we can call them in order to emphasize that we're better than they are. I recall some years ago having an argument with my in-laws. I never really understood how my wife at the time could have emerged from that background as the gentle, loving, clear-headed soul that she is. But I, I remembered having this argument in which they insisted that people on welfare, and they very insistent, very insistent about, even though they imagined that most people on welfare were black, that they meant all people on welfare, very insistent about this, they said the people on welfare are laughing at us because we work. Now, when I said I didn't see much to laugh about about living on a welfare budget and suggested that if welfare recipients had it so good that maybe my in-laws might want to change places with them, the response I got was, oh, no, 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 we'd hate it. 
It's just that they don't know any better. That contempt is classism. And the bigotry, the socioeconomic bigotry, that bigotry that denies the poor the humani their humanity, that reduces the poor to a, to a mostly undifferentiated mass, marked for the most part as greedy, selfish, lazy moochers, and at best as humble supplicants, shuffling their feet and tugging at their forelocks, gazing at the ground, while we grandly decide if we will deign to condescend to throw a nickel at them. That bigotry distorts our politics, it twists our morals. It denies what is best in us, compassion and understanding, and instead advances what's worst in our lizard brain natures. And what's worse, I believe classism is growing. I believe it's getting worse. Now, in a way, that's not surprising. Uh, long periods of economic stress, uh, long periods of economic entrenchment can lead people into adopting a defensive me and mine posture. And there certainly has been enough economic stress of late, and I don't mean just this past couple of years, I mean like the past 30 plus years, a time over which real median family income has gone essentially nowhere despite an increase in two earner families and an increase in average hours worked. For decades we have been working harder and longer and getting nothing for it except shrunken futures and less job security. In a race, it's always easier to resent those who are coming up from behind than those in front of you, even if they're pulling away from you, because it's the people coming up behind who are a threat to your position. In the same way, it's easier to resent the poor, the poor who are lazing about on your tax dollars, than it is to question the rich who are daily enriching themselves by sucking the life out of your economic hopes and draining off all the economic gains that your increased work has produced. So yes, it may not be surprising that classism is growing. If you want another measure, another indication that classism is growing, consider this. In the entire presidential race to date, how many times has the word poverty been mentioned? How many times have the poor even been mentioned? Other than Newt Grinch, that is other than Grinch waxing nostalgic for the days of child labor. Instead of concern for the poor, we got Barack Obama being called the food stamp president as some kind of supposedly debilitating slammer, as saying that the fact is there's a lot more poor people, but the problem isn't there's more poor people, the problem is they're getting help. You, you know, my blog, my blog is called Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. I, I called it that because I hold out hope that we will survive this dark time, this dark time of the past couple of decades. That at some point we will rediscover our morality as a people. We will rediscover and be shocked by the persistence of poverty, hunger, homelessness in our society. But the thing is, even as I wrote that, wrote that phrase, thinking about what I was going to say today, even as I wrote that down, I remembered saying much the same thing in much the same words 20 years ago. That realization, that rediscovery has not yet happened. The Occupy movement, which at least focused on the right target, the 1%, came close, but it hasn't happened. The truth is, sometimes I despair of it happening at all, but for reasons that I frankly cannot explain to you, I still manage to maintain the hope. Let's take a break. And we're back. Okay, now, um, on April 6, 2009, oh, by the way, I should tell you, before I forget, that we're actually going here to our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Uh, on April 6, 2009, a 6.3 magnitude earthquake struck the town of L'Aquila in the Apennine region of central Italy. 308 people in and around the town were killed. The historic center of the town was devastated. It's still largely abandoned. On Monday, on Monday, this past Monday, an Italian court convicted seven scientists and experts of manslaughter, sentenced them to six years in prison for failing to predict the earthquake. They were also ordered to pay court costs and damages of $10.2 million and banned from ever holding public office again. 
Now, this would be—I mean, this would be hilarious. This would be like a Marx Brothers movie, if it wasn't real. If it wasn't real, there is no currently known method for predicting earthquakes. Period. Now, scientists, seismologists, have gotten much better at predicting the areas where earthquakes are more likely. They've e even gotten better at predicting time frames. But predicting an earthquake is beyond human capability. Uh, even those time frames I talk about, they can often be measured in decades. You know, well, you're likely to have an earthquake sometime in the next 50 years. Alexander Petri at the, uh, Alexandra Petri at the uh, Washington Post got it right. Uh, her blog post on the case was titled, Italian Scientists Found Guilty of Manslaughter for Failure to Perform Magic. I mean, my gosh, this is getting frightening. It really is. It really is. I mean, here we have ignorant twits like Representative Paul Brown. This is the man who recently said, and I'm quoting him, all that stuff I was taught about evolution and embryology and the Big Bang Theory, all of that is lies straight from the pit of hell. And he serves on the House Science Committee. Over in the Senate, we have Senator James Inhofe, the man who says global warming is a hoax because the Bible says so. And he's the ranking Republican on the Committee on Environment and Public Works. And now in Italy, they're putting people in jail for failing to predict earthquakes. Here, it's like that um, uh, 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 scientists are either liars or stupid. In Italy, it's like they know everything. And in both cases, science gets trashed. And scientific research and scientific progress gets trashed. In one case, because you won't take them seriously. In the other case, because if you're going to throw them in prison, if they ever make a wrong, wrong prediction, who's going to predict anything at all? In fact, none of this is an outrage. This, this, I, I, this is the outrage of the week. You know what? This also gets the clown award. This also gets the clown award because this is clownishness of mind-boggling proportions. Brown is a clown. Inhofe is a clown. And the prosecutors and the judge of L'Aquila and the people of L'Aquila who, who applauded this decision, they are all scientifically ignorant clowns. All right. So we're going to actually end up here. We're going to take a break from politics and serious stuff uh, and just have our occasional feature, our fun feature, and another thing. This is where we do a lot of just little science stuff, generally. Uh, the first thing is that the Mars rover Curiosity has found some bright stuff on Mars. Now, Curiosity had been taking scoops of Martian soil and dumping them out. This was like to clean the scoop before they actually analyze anything with it, try to make sure that everything in there was actually Martian. And they stopped at one point because they saw something on the ground which turned out to be a piece of plastic that had broken off the lander at landing. Um, and so they dumped out this stuff that was in there because they found this other bright stuff in there and they assumed it was more plastic. Turns out it's not. There's little bright things that are actually part of the Martian soil. They don't quite know what they are yet. So that's probably one of the things that there's actually going to be measuring. Um, now, it's been soon now that they've decided this is of Martian orig uh, origin. What they're going to do is they're going to take a scoop of this stuff and they're going to dump it on a plate. And that's going to be taken inside the rover to be chemically analyzed. And then they're going to do another scoop for a different sort of analysis. So... Um, this is actually uh, what's going on on Mars, and now already they're finding stuff on Mars that they didn't know was there. All right, a second thing here, a second little science thing here. Now, one of the other things that, that Curiosity has discovered was that there was water on Mars. And it's just absolutely, there's no question, but at one time water flowed on the surface of Mars. There are markings on the surface that um, are identical to the kind of markings that flowing water produces on rocks and, and sand in the, uh, on Earth. So there's actually no... So the idea is looking at Mars today, knowing Mars was more Earth-like in the past, looking at Mars today might give us a sense of what's in our future. Now, one of the things, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the big things that keeps life on Earth safe um, is that we have a magnetic field. 
That shields the Earth from some of the solar wind and also helps uh, block some of the cosmic radiation and it helps existing life by, um, well in some cases it helps them migrate, helps birds and some on, some on migrate following the magnetic lines. However, the magnetic field of the Earth is getting weaker. Its strength has dropped by 10% in the last 150 years and scientists say within 500 years it could disappear altogether. Now that could be bad news because the lack, the lack of a um, magnetic field on Mars is one of the reasons that there appears to be no life, or at least if it is, it's hidden, because losing a magnetic field, which happened to Mars billions of years ago, allows the solar wind, which is the flow of particles coming from the sun, to basically blow away the atmosphere. And what atmosphere is left is no protection against the, so, uh, the uh, cosmic rays, so basically any life, if it did exist, would have either been wiped out or driven underground. Now, that's not likely to happen to Earth, because this business of the uh, magnetic field weakening has happened before. What happens is the magnetic field weakens, it almost disappears, and then it flips, so that north and south reverse directions. It's happened several times in the Earth's history. In fact, about every 250,000 years it's happened, according to the geological record. Which also means, though, since the last one was about 800,000 years ago, we're really overdue for one of these flips. The effects are going to be hard to predict. Now, it's unlikely to really have severe damage uh, to, our, to our lives, because it's the, uh, uh, to life on Earth, because uh, the magnetic field will not completely disappear. But it could affect things like migrating birds and so on, who may find it hard to migrate. Uh, they're going to have to learn other means of, of uh, keeping track of their path. Otherwise, they may find it hard to do things like reproduce. So it could affect things like that. The other thing is that uh, um, the, the uh, disruptions could occur with electronic electronic equipment, satellites could be disrupted, which means GPS could be disrupted, some radio communication could be disrupted because the weakening magnetic fields allows more solar wind, allows more solar radiation, more cosmic radiation to penetrate. While that might not affect life, it can affect our technology. The other thing is that when these poles shift, it's not just a matter of north and south just kind of doing this and swapping places. No, as the field diminishes, what you start getting is a lot of little poles popping up, north and south poles popping up all over the planet, which means a compass would be completely useless. And anything that relied on using a compass would also be completely useless. In fact, the European Space Agency is taking this seriously enough to be planning to launch three satellites next month in order to improve our, what is so far, our fairly, fairly hazy understanding of what's called the magnetosphere, which is that sort of that surrounding magnetic field. All right, another thing, another thing. This really cool picture could be a picture of our future, our very, very, very far distant future, but our future nonetheless. This is a picture of two galaxies colliding. Now colliding may not be the best word to use actually since this has been taking, this process has taken eons, but it's basically now complete so much so that these, what had been two separate galaxies, now are given a single name. The decidedly unromantic, but the decidedly, decidedly astronomically precise NGC 2623. The thing is, the two galaxies that now form this one were formerly spiral galaxies about the same size, about the same mass as the Milky Way. And what's more, our own galaxy is on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy, uh, which is also a spiral galaxy like ours and is just somewhat larger than the Milky Way. So when that collision occurs, which will take place in about 3.75 billion years, so don't bother buying film, um, this, this may be how it will look at the end of all those things. And, and since it's unlikely we'll be around in 3.75 billion years, this may be our best chance to get a look at it. Oh, and by the way, those blue streaks swirling out, those are massive dust clouds where young, hot, which means blue stars are being born. Those are blue stars. This is like huge cosmic nurseries. All right, uh, one more thing I think I've got here. I'm not sure how much, actually two, how much time have we got? Five minutes? I think I might get both of these in. Uh, 
Uh, archaeologists have found a 5,500 year old tomb possibly belonging to a Stone Age chieftain. They found it at a megalithic monument in Sweden known as Ales Stenar or Ales Stones. It has 59 massive boulders that are shaped uh, in the shape of a 220 foot long ship. The site has sometimes been called the Swedish Stonehenge. The thing is, the Ale Stone site is only about 1400 years old, but it likely dates from the end of Sweden's Iron Age. But the marks on the stones are strikingly similar to stones that are from Stone Age technology. So researchers have thought for a long time that these stones actually were taken from some other monument. Now they think they found it, just 40 yards away. Uh, imprints of large boulders were found. They apparently had they apparently been removed. These large boulders mark the site of what appears to have been a Neolithic burial chamber called a dolmen, which consists of several upright stones with one flat stone across the top. Now, based on the layout, this dolmen may be 5,500 years old, which, if it's confirmed, could make the source of the Swedish Stonehenge older than the actual Stonehenge. All right, one last thing, uh, because if this pans out, and get this in, because this, if this pans out, this could be really exciting. 20 years ago, a uh, paleontologist named Mary Schweitzer made a remarkable discovery, what seemed to be a remarkable discovery. She was looking through a microscope at a slice of dinosaur bone, and she, looked, she, she noticed what looked for all the world like red blood cells. Now... She's like, this can't be right because, you know, organic material is not supposed to survive fossilization. Uh, but test after test indicated they actually were blood cells of a 67 million year old Tyrannosaurus rex. In the years that followed, she and her colleagues discovered other apparent soft tissues, including what seemed to be blood vessels and uh, feather fibers. Now, obviously, these findings were controversial. A lot of people dismissed them. Uh, one of the big arguments, one of the big claims was that what these, what appeared to be organic tissues were actually what's called biofilm. This is a slime formed by microbes that have invaded the fossilized bones later on. Well, Schweitzer and her colleagues continued to do this research, continued to amass their arguments. The latest evidence comes from a molecular analysis of what looked to be bone cells from two different sorts of dinosaurs. The researchers isolated these cells. They subjected them to several tests, which again seemed to indicate that all this was organic material. Now, the investigators also claim to have found amino acid sequences of proteins in extracts of this dinosaur bone that match sequences from certain proteins that are present in the cells of all animals. And while some of these proteins are also found in bacteria or other things that might have invaded the cells, some of them aren't. And apparently this bone matched all of these. Uh, Schweitzer and her colleagues detailed their findings, their latest findings, in a paper that was released October 16th, and there was a talk October 17th at the annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Apparently, as part of this talk, she said, here's, uh, as part of this talk, she had a slideshow, and she says, here's all our evidence that this was really bioslime, or biofilm, rather. It's a blank slide. She said they found no evidence whatsoever that it's biofilm. Like I said, if this pans out, uh, and, and that's still a real if, but if this pans out, if it does, we could actually possibly be looking at dinosaur DNA. And wouldn't that be really, really cool? All right, that's it for me. That's it for me. I'm done for the week. You just have the best week you possibly can. I will see you next week. Uh, next week, yes, I suppose I will talk about the election. Um, because everybody else will be, so I might as well too. But uh, so anyway, we will see you next week. And uh, again, you have the best week you possibly can. And until then, be well.